The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Hello, Viewpoint listeners. This is BaseNet Internet Television National Political Correspondent Tony Mizuko coming to you with episode 10. I can't believe it. We episode made 10 it. Of Viewpoint. And I'm here tonight with our producer and director of programming for BaseNet Internet Television, Ed Jupin. Ed, how you doing? Excellent. And we had another great primary night tonight that I'm sure you'll cover. And uh, show 10. That's fantastic. It is. You know, I want to take a minute before we get started, and I really do want to thank all of our listeners out there. Our oh, numbers for um, all of BaseNet's programming, but Viewpoint in particular, have been really fantastic, and they keep, you know, they go up a little bit every week. And we're just really thrilled that we have so many listeners out there and so many of you take the time to listen to us, to download our podcasts, to listen to it through the website and whatnot. And uh, we just want to say a very big thank you to all of you out there for listening to Viewpoint, and we hope to continue uh, our, the program through the election season and beyond. And once the election season has ended, we're going to get back into our regular political coverage that we started the show off with. And uh, by then, hopefully, we'll be bringing you a co-host so you don't have to listen to my god-awful voice the entire time. But uh, stay tuned because there's big things planned for Viewpoint. And, uh, again, just a big thank you out there to all of our listeners for continuing to support us, to con continuing to support BaseNet. Absolutely. That being said, we're going to jump right into covering some of these primaries. Now, we're not going to cover the Illinois primary first. I want to backtrack because I didn't get a chance yeah, to Yeah, because we weren't around last week because our, our last show was actually our After Dark special where we brought you like almost two hours worth of coverage for Super Tuesday. We did a special on Super Tuesday. So we actually missed last week. So I guess you need to backtrack to bring us up to date from last week. I do. We're going to start off with the Battle for the South with Mississippi and Alabama which Rick Santorum won, and this was considered to be an absolute necessity for Santorum to win. He would have been done if he didn't. Gingrich did very well, coming in third in both cases, but getting 29% in Alabama and 31% in Mississippi. But the real winner, and I hate to sound like the mainstream media, even though Rick Santorum won both of them, the real winner is really Mitt Romney. And here's why. Mitt Romney was not expected to do well in the South. He was not expected to play strong to the conservatives down there, to the evangelicals. We know this. We've been over it before on Viewpoint. You're all intelligent listeners. You know this. And then but up until the last minute, up until uh, last, I guess I was last Tuesday, he was uh, even looking like he might have pulled out Mississippi. Right. It was very close. He ended up getting 31% of the vote, and Santorum got 33% of the vote, a difference of 6,000. Now, Gingrich got 31%, technically came in second because he beat Romney by about 1,400 votes. But 33% to 31% from Santorum to Romney is not a sweep of the South. And I want to backtrack. And, you know, we said Santorum had to win the South. He really had to sweep the South. 33 to 31 is a victory, but it's not a sweep. As and did that, Gingrich, obviously. And exactly. I, I know you're going to give your opinion on Gingrich, but he obviously, being a Southerner from Georgia, he absolutely had to sweep the South. He did, and he didn't sweep the South. He needed to, and he just couldn't pull it off. He did very well, getting about a third of the vote in both of them, 31% in Mississippi, 29% in Alabama. But again, he tied Romney in both states. So you've got to look at that and really wonder who the conservative candidate is. Who are these people voting for if they're giving the same amount of votes to Romney as Gingrich? So although a Santorum victory on both uh, accounts, he won a little bit bigger in Alabama, 35 to 29 but again, Gingrich still only had 29, the same as Romney. And again, was lost out to Romney by about 1,500, 1,800 votes. That's not very significant. In reality, it was a three-way draw. Now, you can make the argument that if Gingrich hadn't been in the race or Santorum hadn't been in the race, a significant percentage of their votes would have gone to the other candidate and they would have trounced Romney. But Now, was Ron Paul on the ballot in either Mississippi or Alabama or he, no? He was. He did four percent and five percent in Mississippi and Alabama uh, respectively less than he usually does but when we look at some of the later caucuses he's back up to his nine ten twelve percent and he actually had a fairly good night for Ron Paul in Illinois and I think he's going to continue with his ten percent or so and remember depending on what happens down the road in June in California he's likely to do well there and well elsewhere uh, some of the northeastern states he'll do fairly well in but if you take Mississippi and you were to combine Santorum and Gingrich, it'd be 64 to 31. But that's assuming that all of those votes automatically went from one to the other. Some of them would get siphoned off to Romney. And even if instead of going from 60 to 30, it became 50 to 40, 
all of a sudden you're not talking about a huge victory of uh, a huge margin of victory here. Same thing in Alabama. If you combine Santorum and Gingrich's total, you come up with 64 to 29. But that's assuming every single voter, none of them went to Romney. So if you say 65 to 30, but 10 percent went, again, 55 to 40 is a good victory. But Romney's not down and out by any means. He's not polling where Paul is at 5 or 10 percent. So there's still a significant, and I'm lowballing, I think, the amount of voters for, from Santorum and Gingrich that would go to Romney because I think, especially in those two states, Gingrich supporters supported Gingrich, didn't want Santorum because he was the other conservative in the race, and vice versa. I don't really think you'd get 70, 80% of their voters just going right to the other candidate. Romney would be able to pick a lot of those voters up. And again, you're all of a sudden looking at... I think, we combined... said, I think we said several weeks ago that Santorum voters would tend to go to Romney a lot easier then Gingrich voters would go to Right, Romney. and Santorum came out ahead in both states. And I think that that's ultimately what would happen. You really aren't seeing a trouncing of Mitt Romney that people would need, people like Santorum need, for him to, st to stay in the race, for him to say, hey, I'm beating Mitt Romney, because he's really not. And where he is, he's barely beating him. But that was Mississippi, and that was Alabama. Congratulations to Santorum for his victory in both. But I don't An think it was another trifecta Tuesday or right, a do, another... do, do facta Tuesday. <laughs> what are we going to call it? Do facta Tuesday. Do facta Tuesday. But again, not a big enough win for Santorum. We then come to Hawaii, which was, I believe, the same day, correct? Then yeah, same day. We had Puerto Rico uh, about a week and a half later. Now, Hawaii, Romney won. No surprise. Romney pulled in. It was a very, very small caucus, a very small state. Uh, Romney pulled nine, in 45. Nine delegates, I think, or something. Yeah, something like that. I think the, the total votes cast were, were 10,000. I mean, a very small amount. Now, Romney won 45% of the vote to Santorum's 25, to Gingrich's 11, to Paul's 18. Go Ron Paul in Hawaii coming in third with 18% of the vote. Now, Mitt Romney did not win half of the Hawaii caucus. That's significant. But if we're playing this as a race between the moderates and the conservatives... Santorum and Gingrich's total, if you combine them, is only 36%, which is less than Romney's 45%. And again, that's assuming every single voter went for one of them or the other and didn't go for Romney or didn't go for Paul. Even if you were to add Paul's numbers in, you're at 54%. Obviously, I spent a lot of time doing that math when I could have just looked at Romney's numbers. <laughs> 54 to 45. So yes, he's not winning half the party. Yes, he's not winning that 90%. But that's assuming that one other candidate would automatically win over Romney. And for people who think this is a problem, I want to point out the last couple presidential elections going back, we haven't really had those, uh, those triumphant winners, at least if you look at a percentage of the vote. We know sometimes that the Electoral College swings it a lot one way or the other. But no president in quite a while has won, you know, 80% of the popular vote. Do we know what Obama is getting now in the Democratic primaries, even though obviously he's virtually unopposed? You know, not to say people aren't running against him, but he's virtually unopposed. He is, I believe what he actually lost, is he polling? you know, it, very low, but yeah. people rarely vote in a Democratic caucus when they're... When there's no opposition, is. right. But I believe it was, uh, it wasn't, I believe it was Missouri where, no, I'm sorry, not Missouri, it might have been Mississippi, I'll have to look, where Obama was actually lost a couple counties. Okay. Now, that usually doesn't happen, but somebody had made a point of getting themselves on the ballot and, and beating the president sure. just to try to send a message. It'd be interesting. Uh, I'll have to look up to it for our next episode to get a little bit more detail into it. But it shows that there is some frustration on the left with President Obama, and there are some people in his own party that are not quite happy with him. Now, I remember hearing close to a year ago, and even again six months ago, that people have vowed there will be a challenge from the left for Obama. Nobody's sure, because don't forget, he started on the left. He he ran when he was a senator. Yeah, he ran as a true liberal. And the day of his inauguration, he immediately became a moderate. Right. He People are very upset about Gitmo. People are very upset that he didn't push Obamacare more. They're upset he didn't do a lot more. And I mean, even some moderate Democrats, I think, had kind of accepted the fact, well, hey, we've got this very left-wing president, you know, maybe he's going to make some changes and we'll see what happened. And I think reality set in, but I don't know, I think maybe the, the idea is that those on the left are going to send a challenge, be symbolic, but not participating in any of these primaries, who knows, I mean, could the, the Green Party, the Rainbow Green Party stick a candidate up there? Sure. Now, do I think it's going to have a big impact on the race? No, but here's one of those infamous buts. One or two percent might be what determines this election. So one or two percent of the far left not voting for President if, Obama. If you pull it away from Obama, sure. Right. 
is going to make a difference, and it could. So again, are you going to get Obama getting 30% of the vote and some other left-wing candidate getting 12%? Not at all. And real quick, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, and it, there were some arrests at a supposedly Occupy protest in the last week or so. Right. I want to say this again. If those protests turn bad and they're planning all sorts of stuff for their spring and their one-year anniversary, that is not going to help the president, and it is not going to help his image. Because he's got to win over moderates, people who don't really think the country's improving. They don't really think the economy's improving, I should say. And they're not sure. And if they start seeing all these protests, Obama's either going to distance himself from them, which is going to hurt him with his base, or try to associate himself with them, which is going to hurt him with moderates and just give Republicans all sorts of cannon fodder. So again, while I would never want to be caught helping the left, if you people want your guy, and this is viewpoint, so you know we try to be try to wade through the bullshit and be honest. If you want my honest opinion, to those of you on the left, tone down your stupid Occupy protests because you're only going to hurt your president, who is the best chance for any of your whack job policies to actually be enacted and to continue to be enacted. He is the best friend to the radical left this country has ever had. Why would you want to hurt him? Again, I don't want to give them advice. Being the political scientist that I am... I can't go without saying it that you can potentially be hurting your own candidate. A little bit of a break there. I know I said that last episode. I'm going to continue setting it, saying it. Maybe I hope it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where if I keep saying it, it'll happen. So anyway, Hawaii, just to recap again, Romney did very well in Hawaii. We now move on to Puerto Rico, which Romney won. And I think it was quite possibly a mistake for uh, – not a mistake for Santorum, but Santorum didn't do well. He made some comments about Puerto Rico that I think came back to bite him in the butt. In another day in time, we'd really go into some of those co comments. You know, he, he made a, a statement about how if Puerto Rico becomes a state, English should be, you know, its language. And I know that upset a lot of Puerto Ricans. They said that we're not going to vote for somebody who said that. My honest opinion without getting off the top of the election is that's probably some sort of a truism that would need to be discussed. How do you have 50 states that are English-speaking states and one bilingual state? Again, I think it's a classic example of Rick Santorum saying something and the media focusing on something that's not really a big deal. Because let's face it, whether or not Puerto Rico becomes a 50, the 51st state or not, whether or not English is the mandatory language or it's bilingual, America is not going to be very different one way or the other. Not going to impact the economy, not going to make a change in the Middle East, not going to cure cancer. None of that stuff is going to happen one way or the other. So the media, I'm going to blame the mainstream media here for focusing on something that Rick Santorum said that is just not a big deal. It upset people. I understand that. I don't want to upset people saying that it's not important to them. But in the grand scheme of the presidential election, it's really not. And I think the media probably blew it out of proportion. Rick Santorum blew his chances in Puerto Rico. They went for Mitt Romney. There was also that picture of Mitt Romney, uh, sorry, of uh, Rick Santorum lying on a beach or, or by a pool in Puerto Rico and being very pasty white, as you'd expect a man from Pennsylvania to be, with a little bit too much, too big of a love handle. Yeah, and by blowing his chances in Puerto Rico, he also blew his chances in Illinois, which we'll get to from tonight. Because his disappointing turnout in uh, showing in Illinois was because he was gallivanting around Puerto Rico and he ignored Illinois. Right. And I think that it was a mistake. It's always a mistake. But here's why. Romney won in Illinois, which is good. We're going to talk about we're going to get to Gingrich in a few minutes, Ed. So don't worry. Romney won in Illinois. It was 47 to 35. You look at numbers like that and you think, yes, it's 12 points. But Santorum did get 35% of the vote. Maybe if he had put a little bit more effort into Illinois, mm -hmm. he could have won. Illinois is one of those states that's following a dangerous trend in this country where we're becoming more European in the sense that you have cities that are full of your more educated people, your more affluent people. You know, they're becoming mega cities, and then you've got your slightly less educated, less affluent people out in the suburbs. Now, or is it because of the fact that it's uh, Obama's home state, and it's obviously going to go again for Obama more than likely in November? It would be fair to say. Oh, it will, but it's, you know, a state so. where there's a, it's definitely a state where there's a clear contrast between Chicago and the rest of the state. I know mm -hmm. people in southern Illinois have actually said that they wish you know, they. In all seriousness, they want their own state separate yeah. from Chicago. Now, that's important because it's a state where a candidate should want to win as a, you know, obviously in a general election. Romney probably won the business, more moderate Republicans in the Chicago area, and Santorum did well, I think, in the south. In the, in the suburbs, suburbs. Just, like he, just like he's been doing in almost every state so far. Right. He's winning the suburbs. But I think he could have done better if he put that effort into it. But. Romney still won with 12%. It's still another win. Romney's showing he's winning the states and he's winning the people that are going to be more important in a general election. Because, again, Mississippi and Alabama are probably going to go for the Republican candidate. 
states like Ohio, states like uh, Illinois, who I think is going to go for Obama. But again, those are the states where you've got to show that you're winning against uh, winning with those candidates. Before we move on to what I'm going to call Santorum's little last stand and Santorum's last stand, let's talk about Newt Gingrich. In the Illinois primary, after an okay showing in the South, Illinois primary, Newt, diabetic-ridden ass Gingrich, <laughs> came in with 8% of the vote. One whole percent, 11,000 votes, less than Ron, Ron Paul, Paul, who got 9% of the votes. Good for you, Ron Paul. I'm still waiting for, you know, this is only 97% of the precincts reporting. I still haven't seen any Herman Cain votes, so I'm just waiting for those to come in, <laughs> any of those Cain supporters out there. Now, Gingrich, I predicted the last episode of Viewpoint that Gingrich was done. I'm not changing that prediction, but I He's done. He's just not going anywhere. Right. I, I felt he would have just gotten out of the race because he would have realized that he's he, he's done. He's got no hope. And I said this last time. I said he's got to overcome Santorum, and then he's got to overcome Romney. Where is this happening? Illinois, he gets 8%? Mm -hmm. Less than Ron Paul. And they're still calling him one of the three candidates, yeah. not talking about Ron Paul, no, exactly. who just beat him here. And also, if we go back to our Hawaii results, just let me bring this up because it makes New Gingrich look bad. Paul beat him 18 to 11%. So Gingrich is really tying, vying, whatever, for third, fourth with Paul. Paul's not getting the mention in the media, which is a normal thing, so we're going to mention him here on Viewpoint. But where is Gingrich coming from this? My prediction, Gingrich is done. He cannot remotely win the nomination, short of Romney coming out and sacrificing a puppy on TV or Santorum driving a stake through the heart of whatever, I don't know, or something god-awful that Santorum would be likely to do if we were trying to roast him. Whatever god-awful things they would do is the only way Gingrich would shoot up to the top. He's done. He had his surge. It's over. I think he's just being a bitter old bastard by staying in the race. Okay. He's very, very close, very much on the line of destroying his political career. Now, Newt's a bright guy. He's not well liked, but he's well was well respected. He's written a lot of books. If you read some of his books, they're actually very good books. A lot of them are historic books. A lot of them are those, uh, you know, those Harry Turtle Dove type books where they talk about, you know, what if happened. Some of them are stories about historical events that they're not true, but it's really like how it would have happened. Or it's very authentic. Gingrich is dangerously close to people getting pissed off at him, not wanting to hear from him, just being sort of booted to the sidelines of history. He really needs to come to grips. And maybe it's tough because he realizes he's approaching the end of his life. He's in terrible shape. He can't live much longer. <laughs> uh, you know, he's fat. He's out of weight. Yeah, out of weight. He's out of shape and all that. You look at him and he just looks sick. You know, whereas Romney, who I think is about the same age as Gingrich, yeah. looks like he's, you know, 20 years younger. And then Ron Paul, who's like 10 years older than Gingrich. Looks 20 years younger than all of them. <laughs> exactly. You're right. You know, Ron Paul could probably uh, run a marathon. Whereas Newt Gingrich, yep. you know, nearly passes out putting his friggin' uh, ass cream on or whatever. He's really at the point where he could possibly destroy what's left of his image in America, his his history, whatever you want to call it. What he leaves behind, he's very close to destroying because if he continues – and let me tell you, and I know you've said this before, Ed, his, his half speech, if you want to call it that, his statement released at the end of the Illinois primary showed that he's just a jerk. He doesn't have that class in that – He's a douchebag. Douchebag. That's a very good way of saying it. That's maybe not a political scientist term, but it's a real term, and it really describes Newt Gingrich. Neither is no a, class, uh, no a class whatsoever. Term, but... No class whatsoever. Right. And, and I... Rick Santorum gave the classical congratulations to Mitt Romney for winning Illinois. You could tell it was from the heart. He meant it. You know, congratulations, Mitt. Ran a good race. All of this, and all send all uh, Gingrich did was bitch about the fact that Romney outspent everybody 7 to 1 and he's just he's just buying his way into an election. Right. And, and it, I think it hurts him because for a couple of reasons. One, you're showing you're a douchebag. Two, Romney, I mean Santorum is a classy guy. He's a classic politician and I don't mean that in the bad sense of he he knows he's got to get up there. He knows he's got to give that speech. He knows he's got to say But when he loses, often. he loses like a gentleman. Right. And, you know, Romney, too, I think is a guy with some class. Yes, he is. He'll speak honestly. He'll accept a loss. He does what he's supposed to do. And Newt Gingrich, who all along everyone said Newt Gingrich is a jerk. And then he tries he's to say, oh, no, it now. I'm not a jerk. Yep. It, it's no, this guy is a jerk. This is why people don't like Newt Gingrich. This is why people don't like him. He comes off as very unpresidential. And if there's one thing you can say about Mitt Romney, 
He's incredibly presidential. Even Santorum, depending on the context, Santorum comes off as presidential. You know, he gets a little angry, but he gets passionate and he's up there and he's speaking about issues that he cares. Whereas Newt Gingrich just seems like he's trying to win an argument. Newt Gingrich, you get the impression he's trying to make somebody feel stupid. And a lot of people don't like that. A lot of people want their president. They want their leader to inspire them. They want them to make them think about bigger and better things and to do bigger, he's better things. He's just belittling everybody and showing he no is, class. He, he's very good at tearing people down. And hopefully he does that to Obama when the general election rolls around. But he's just coming off like a jerk. And nobody wants to see that. Romney and Santorum have had a tough race. And, you know, I know Santorum, you know, I'll give you an example of Santorum being a, a classy guy. People brought up, was it four or five years ago, he said pick Mitt Romney. He's a conservative candidate. And obviously through the campaign, Santorum said he's not. Santorum came out and said, yeah, I said that. It was true. You know, uh, whatever. Santorum got in trouble a couple months ago because I think it was at one of the debates, all 49 of them or whatever. <laughs> Santorum said, hey, politics is a team sport. And everyone got all angry at him. And I, well, I mean, he's being a realist. Remember, these people are opponents, but they are opponents on the same side. I think, you know, Santorum saying, hey, it's a team sport. Hey, I did support Romney, but he's running against them. I mean, you can't get up there on a stage with somebody, you know, or the national stage or the media, whatever it is, agree with everything somebody says, because then they're not going to want to pick you. You're going to say, well, if you're agreeing with everything your opponent says, why don't we pick your opponent? You have to try to show why you're different. You have to fight your opponent. I mean, it's an interesting element of politics. And I think Gingrich is showing that he is the lesser man, so to speak coming out of it i did read earlier in this week gingrich's campaign is now in the red for the i think it was the month of february they were in the red and that donation yeah, because remember you can't up. use you can't use super PAC money to pay your staff and all of that so right and he that they were in the red and donations are starting to dry up which i correctly predicted that they would start to dry up i think after this anyone who's supporting gingrich said good god he didn't win the south like we thought he needed to eight percent less than ron paul came off like a jerk isn't paying attention I mean, if Gingrich can't win the South, and he can't win the North, and he can't win the Heartland, what the hell can Gingrich win? Certainly not the whole country. Well, I think we here on Viewpoint have uh, personally done our part to bury Gingrich. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's pushing a de-endorsement. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I'll, I'll go and, it's, and it's only been Bachman so far that's gotten that from you. Exactly. You know, for, for a conservative guy, I seem to keep picking these Republicans, but he on the line. I mean, I've spoken negatively about him. I hate to give him more more press and more publicity but gingrich is just dying and you know what that might be a good thing for our uh, for the republican party and for our country as a whole he's got no chance i think especially after this his donations are going to continue to dry up and what often happens in a situation like this is people say well donations dry up but they stick in the race you literally get to a point where there's no money in the bank account yeah because like i said you can't you know people look at the multi-million dollar super PACs that all of these candidates have, but you can't use that for your general day-to-day -day operating expenses, paying staff, exactly. et cetera. They say, they say, hey, you know, we've got to go hit campaign stops in place X, wherever it happens to be. You know, well, we've only got $20,000 to do it. Well, we've got to fly out 10 people and we've got to do the mm -hmm. advance work and we need the hotels and you need the ads yep. and all this. And all of a sudden, that's how a campaign collapses very quickly. You stop paying your people. I've even read that there are even some people starting to grumble that they're not getting paid by Gingrich, some vendors here and there. Sure. So I mean, a problem like that, if you were to think of a business, and I'll use an analogy most people can understand. You think of a pizza shop, my favorite analogy for everything. I can explain the whole world through your average pizza shop. <laughs> now, let's say you got a pizza shop that needs to make a thousand bucks a day in cash to survive places a couple hundred thousand dollar cash flow after your expenses your payroll you'll be lucky if the owner makes 50 60 grand a year you need to make that thousand dollars a day you know that you know there are days you're not gonna some days you'll do better if all of a sudden on monday instead of hitting your sales goal of a thousand bucks you get 300 and then tuesday you get 320 and then mm -hmm. wednesday you get 200 and you're, then you're not gonna you make payroll come friday exactly you're not gonna make payroll so then you start cutting and then you start hacking. It happens a week again. You've laid everyone off except you and yourself and your I. Uh, you yourself and I. That doesn't make sense. You yourself <laughs> and you. And then the numbers keep coming in. Well, then you can't pay your vendors. Then you, And I mean you're talking about a business like that that runs on a, you know, we talk about individuals living paycheck to paycheck. A business like that lives day to day basically. And all of a sudden it can collapse very, very quickly. A campaign is the same way. You're looking at it, you're saying, we're doing great, man. We're averaging fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a day in donations. And then all of a sudden, oh, wow, we only got $2,200 yesterday. Must have been a fluke. People must have been asleep all day or it was a holiday. And then the next day it's 2200 And then it's 1800 And then it's 1000 And then it's, hey, we only got $800 in donations today. And all of a sudden, whoop, and it happens quickly. Those bills pile up. 
in one minute you're projecting out, all right, this trip's going to cost thirty, forty thousand dollars. That's fine. It'll only take us four all four days to make that money. And then all of a sudden, wait a minute, we're not going to make that money for the next ten or twenty days. And that's when candidates finally get up and say, well, got to stop it. Gingrich has a decent amount of money on his own. His family has some money. His wife has a little bit of money there. You'll always get some donations, but very, very quickly that starts to turn. Now, if Newt over the course of February ended up running into the red and you know had to stop paying some vendors here and there, here we are mid-March. We can only assume that that's continuing. Where is he going to be two weeks from now, yeah. three weeks from now? Because let me tell you, numbers like these, people aren't going to want to support you. And you're right that PACs can run ads and whatnot, but they can't necessarily fly your campaign around. No. They can't do what you need to do. And you're right, they can't pay your staff. And it's not just the political consultants that are very, very expensive to a staff, uh, to a campaign. A lot of times it's people that you know aren't volunteers that you need somebody to sit in a building and, and to process your payroll, to pay your bills, to do all well, this. And it is even the building. Even if you're lucky enough to find a little campaign office that's only going to cost you a couple hundred dollars a week or something to rent, the super PAC can't pay that rent. Right. So even, even that couple hundred dollars has to come from somewhere. Right. And all of a sudden, and you know, Gingrich, all of a sudden it starts to dry up. Gingrich may not have much experience running a lean campaign. Santorum, very early on, back when he was polling at 1%, ladies and gentlemen for a man who's number two in this race he was at one mm percent -hmm. when it started he kept saying you know we're making our payrolls every week we're making our payrolls how much longer can gingrich say that ron paul is used to running campaigns on very limited money ron paul just won't do any ads he'll just fly out with less people he'll do smaller events he's used to doing it i don't know if gingrich is used to being able to do that if he can all of a sudden run a really lean campaign well and before, before we leave gingrich there is one more southern primary and that's this coming Saturday, we should give the date as opposed to saying this coming Saturday, depending when people are listening to this podcast, March 24th. March 24th is the Louisiana primary, and that wraps up the South. I'm not predicting Gingrich to do any better than, than he did in the past. I don't want to say it's make or break for Gingrich because I think he's already broken. He's broke already. Yeah, well, we exactly. broke him tonight if he wasn't right here yeah, on that's Viewpoint. True. I mean, a win would help him, but I don't think he's going to win. I think he's going to come in third, maybe fourth. Remember, you know, Bobby Jindal is a very popular governor, very popular guy who was rocketing to the top of mm -hmm. Republican politics in this country. And then he delivered, I believe it was the response to the president's first right. State of the Union address, and he absolutely bombed it, which I was very disappointed. I'm a big fan of Bobby Jindal. He's literally a medical doctor. He's a very intelligent man, comes from very intelligent, hardworking parents. Great guy, totally screwed it up, <laughs> national career dashed, at least for a couple of years. He's smart enough that he might want a Romney in there, so to speak. And he may want a position in the administration. He may want to move on. I, I just I think that Gingrich is not as likely to win Louisiana because no. it's the South, it's the deep South, but it's also Louisiana. Remember, Cajun politics are very different. Uh, I once knew the uh, former Inspector General, uh, uh, an Inspector General in Massachusetts, and he became the Inspector General for uh, New Orleans. There's a lot of dirty politics down there. Maybe that means they like Gingrich. But anyway, I've got a topic. I'm not predicting Gingrich to be very do, do very well. Santorum is predicted so. for the win. I think that Romney will also do very well, and Gingrich is just going to fade by the uh, fade by the wayside. I think he's he's done and he's out, and I hope he is. What about this guy from Arizona or wherever with all of the money that is Gingrich's big supporter? You know now, this is, this is a huge businessman who's got a head on his shoulders. How the hell could he just keep dumping so much money into something it's that's no, getting 8%? Last, the last time he gave money, and he was thinking about giving more, and he, he said very openly he wanted to counter the George Soros's out there who can mm -hmm. give that kind of money. Right. But, uh, but that, I mean, uh, how you know, if you're an intelligent person, how long could you give? be given that kind of money to an obviously losing cause. Right, but here's the thing. He he is an intelligent person because he is because he had said the last time that he could see giving another ten million to Gingrich or another candidate. So before Gingrich failed to win the South, before he did horrible in Illinois and Hawaii, he'd even started to say he could see or giving another more candidate. to Gingrich or another candidate. Right. So he left himself right in there. Yeah. I think after today, unless Gingrich can really convince him he's worth it, I don't think he's going to give Gingrich Yeah, that, that well just dried up, and I, I, that would I, really I be the end of it. Showed it. And I think now he's saying, you know what, I'm going to wait and see whatever happens with Santorum or Romney. And if he's a smart business guy, he'll probably go with Romney. But he might also figure, you know what, I played my hand in the, gen in the primary. It didn't work. When the general rolls around, I'm going to be there to count through Obama's money. Yep. So I think that that well is definitely drying up for Gingrich. I think it's done. There's not much more he can do. We're moving on from Louisiana March 24th, which, again, predicting a Santorum victory. Whether it will re-energize his campaign, I don't know. 
There are more conservatives going over to Romney as they're starting to see value in him. I don't think they're just accepting him as the nominee. I think they're being a little bit more educated about it. I actually had a conversation with several people today that what Mitt Romney can't do, what he really needs to do, is say to conservatives in his party, look, you know what, forget this. Let me say this to conservatives out there. And I've said it before. Mitt Romney was the governor of Massachusetts. I mean, it's the People's Republic of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. It is a very liberal, very left-leaning, very politically, I don't want to say corrupt. It is corrupt. But I mean, Massachusetts politics are very different than the politics of any other uh, state in the union. He was governor of that. It's a combination of a lot of things. It's an old boy network. It's a lot of old school Irish politics and machine politics. It's all those things. Very liberal, very progressive. The few Republicans that are here are rhinos and they're moderates and they're country club fair-haired Republicans. But Massachusetts is also a very wealthy state, much wealthier than most other uh, most other countries. Very wealthy, much wealthier than most other states. Massachusetts is a very educated state. Harvard, MIT, et cetera. The state school system here is phenomenal. Higher percentage of people with graduate, uh, with college degrees and graduate degrees here than I think any other state. The best public school system in the country. So Massachusetts is its own weird little beast off in its corner. And Mitt Romney was governor of that. You feel that he's not conservative enough. Well, listen, he's intelligent. He's not going to get anywhere trying to make abortion illegal in Massachusetts. He's not going to get anywhere with some of these really strong social issues. Does that mean he's compromising? No, he's just being intelligent. And I'm going to say something here. As somebody who's not a fan of abortion, and maybe one day we'll have a special show about it, I think Mitt Romney, and I've always felt this about him, is intelligent enough to realize that he's not compromising on these issues, but A, he's not likely to get anywhere, and B, it's not likely to make a big difference one way or the other. Mitt Romney is intelligent enough to focus on what he can fix and what he can make an impact on. Again, you understand it. You want the conservative cause. You want to move in one direction. And I think Romney understands that. But he realizes, especially in Massachusetts, and to an extent nationally, he's not going to make any headway in any of those areas. Now, you take the abortion debate in this country without talking about the merits of abortion one way or the other. That's primarily a Supreme Court issue. The president could be the biggest pro-life or the biggest pro-choice person ever. It's not going to matter. But it's just like that as president. If you're a Republican and you have a Democratic Congress, you're fighting a losing battle and vice versa. Right. You know, if you're a Democratic that. president, you're fighting a Republican Congress. So right. same thing. And I, exactly. And I'm not somebody who's saying we should all compromise and, you know, every politician should be just some mushy moderate and like that. I think he just intelligently realizes what he can do and what and he what can't do. Can't he focuses do. on what no. he can win. I think conservatives are starting to see that about Mitt Romney because what everyone forgets, we have the shortest political memories in history in this country, is last presidential election cycle – McCain was the moderate, and conservatives were split between Romney and Huckabee. McCain's not really a moderate. He's just an idiot. He's a warmonger. Romney was that conservative alternative, him and Huckabee. Him and Huckabee split the, split the, the numbers. If Huckabee hadn't ran, Romney probably would have won the nomination. Yep. An unfortunate thing in politics that we tend to pick the person that not everybody liked because, you know, two other people that everyone liked couldn't agree. But I think conservatives are starting to see that in Mitt Romney. They're also starting to see a principled man with integrity. And I'm not being paid by the Romney campaign by any means to say this, but I think they're looking at how Gingrich has behaved. They're looking at some of Santorum's flubs and they're saying, you know, Mitt Romney's a smart guy. Mitt Romney's a hardworking guy. Mitt Romney has great hair, which I don't care what anyone says is very important in politics. (laughs) So I think Romney's slowly starting to do better. I mean, he's been put through the fire. He was the front runner at the start of this race and has literally survived through all of these other candidates having their surges and then falling off. And, you know, he's done pretty well. I mean, there was the Bachman surge. There was the Kane surge. There was the Perry surge. Out of sure. nowhere, Rick Perry pops on in the scene. Oh, Rick Perry went all, all of a sudden front runner. Front runner. He had his battles back and forth with Romney, and Romney took him down. You know, Gingrich had his surge. Now look where Gingrich is, rubbing, you know, diabetes cream on his fat, diabetic-ridden ass. I don't know why I like saying that phrase, but that's Gingrich. Santorum had his surge, and he's still up there, but Romney's still standing, and I think conservatives are starting to appreciate that, hey, this is a man who's been through the ringer. He can take the punches. We worry that he's not strong enough, uh, you know, that he won't go after the president enough. He won't be hard enough with that attack against the president. Mitt Romney's going to have to be a bit of a jerk, but you know what? He's still there taking punches. I think that's why he's actually starting to do better and better in some of these races where he was expected not to do so well. I mean, again, he did pretty well in the South. We move on to two topics we've got to talk about. 
and I'm going to call it Santorum's Little Stand and Santorum's Last Stand. April 3rd, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Wisconsin are Romney. voting. Going to go for Romney. Wisconsin's the one place that uh, Santorum has a chance, but mm-hmm. with Illinois going, you know, the, the way uh, right. Michigan went and Ohio, I think Romney's going to pull it out. Santorum's, it's interesting with Wisconsin because Santorum is more pro-labor than Romney, and they're very upset about Governor Walker, but conservatives supported Governor Walker, the issue with the unions over there in Wisconsin. Yeah, so, so Wisconsin could be close. It could be, but I'm still predicting Mitt Romney win. D.C., for what it's worth, in Maryland, another terrible state there. Not Romney. Not the D.C. state, that's nor should it ever Romney. be. Yeah, absolutely. Both going to be Romney. So that's in terms of little stand. He's really going to do well there to show that he's still in it, that he's still able to fight and still able to keep it going. If he gets trounced, it's kind of like, give it up, Rick. But I don't think he's going to drop after that because that's Santorum's little stand. Santorum's last stand is April 24th, over a month away, mind you. Pennsylvania. Now, but, yeah. Now, between then, between now and then, they could all drop. But April 24th, it's not just Pennsylvania, though. And yes, it's his, it's his must-win state because it's his home state. But Rhode Island, New York, Delaware, and Connecticut, they are all going to go for Romney. Even if Santorum wins Pennsylvania handily, which is not always guaranteed. No, he again, wins. because he when he lost his Senate seat, it was by 18%. Right, so he's lost big there as, as well as one big, as, we said, as we've said here before on Viewpoint. But there's five states, and Romney's going to win four of them. Ron Paul's not going to win them. And again, Romney is already more than two to one lead in delegates. Right, and, and I think now he's come, been... come you know, April 24th, by the time he's picked up all of these other states we've talked about between now and April 24th, he picks up four out of five states on April 24th. It's just, again, we're talking about this insurmountable lead at this point. Right, and I think Santorum, the perfect time for him to exit would After be— After he wins his home state. Exactly. He wins if he wins state. Pennsylvania and Romney wins those other four states, which he will. Romney will win those four states, barring any horrible mm-hmm. cat- catastrophe or anything. Right. Romney will win those four states, and Santorum can say, look, I know where it's going. There's no point in dragging this out because, you know, I'm not going to get enough to win. And he can make the speech from his own hometown in Pennsylvania. He can make it from his hometown, his home state. He can say, I won my home state. Everyone said I wouldn't win this election. I wouldn't do well. I was at 1%, and now I'm leaving as the number two, Mm -hmm. and I'm okay with that. I won my home state. And I'll be vice president. Perfect, classy time. (laughs) To go and most important, Rick Santorum is set up for either 2016, sure. 2020 to be a vice president, to run for governor. There's a yeah. lot of things. Maybe he'll run for a Senate seat again. You never know. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of things he can do, and it is the perfect setup for Santorum. Short of winning, it's the best possible exit from a situation like yep. this. Whereas Gingrich, if he's still in. Gingrich, like you said, he's ruining his reputation. He is, and he's going to destroy himself. I mean, it, there's going to come a point where he's going to get a call from the RNC, and they're going to say, mm-hmm. you need to stop, or we're disowning yep. you. It's all going to be gone. Maybe they'll sick Ron Paul on him. I did felt that Ron Paul, actually, I'll tell you the exact point when my support for Gingrich began to fade was in one of the debates when Gingrich said he got a deferment because he had uh, children during mm-hmm. Vietnam, and Ron Paul said, I had children, he too. Was I, he was children yep, he was right. married with children and went and served. That was the point where Ron Paul stuck the sword into Gingrich and slayed Newt Gingrich. Let this be a record. A hundred years from now, political scientists studying this election, the point where Gingrich began to die was when Ron Paul killed him, and he killed him with a sword of integrity. That's when Dingerich began to die. That's my prediction. Santorum's little stand and Santorum's last stand. I'm coming up with some great terms throughout this election cycle. So are we short of doing an endorsement yet? Because to be honest with you, before the general election comes, more than likely BaseNet Intermedia Group is going to endorse a candidate for president. But that being said, short of that, are we just about ready to say Romney will probably be the Republican nominee? I believe at this point, my prediction is there is an 80% probability Mitt Romney will be the Republican nominee. The 20% I'm holding out is you've heard me talk about my interesting Paul plan. Mm -hmm. Actually, I should backtrack. I would say I'm probably 90% sure he will be the nominee. I still think Ron Paul has a very intelligent yet devious plan to stick it out and wait till all of a sudden big states like California come up in June and Romney starts not winning all those delegates because Paul's the other guy in the race. And he's going to start finally possibly getting... Yeah, you're sticking to your story. 
I, I am. But I still think that Romney is going to be the nominee. I think one of the reasons Paul hasn't attacked Romney is that Romney, it, you know, people accuse him of being a flip flopper. I think that it's tough for a politician not to have an opinion on an issue. They need to have an opinion or a stance on everything. Does Romney try to go with the political wins? Sure. What politician doesn't? And then he gets in trouble because I think as a man, he generally either doesn't have an opinion on something, a uh, specific issue, or he's rather ambivalent to it. Well, and even even the the infamous flip-flopper of John Kerry over the I was for it before I was against it. Just speaking the truth, that's all he was doing. I was for right. it before I was against it. You know, people's right. you, you're entitled to change your mind. How, how does that just make you this dastardly flip-flopper? Right. You know, you're entitled and, and to change your Ronnie mind. Ronnie has been pretty consistent throughout his career, despite that. You know, he, he's not gone crazy. People right. do change their ideas. And I think Romney said that. You know, do you want somebody who just has one idea and it never changes no i don't think you do i mean it's not like he's changed his ideas on democracy it's not like hey he's reagan a was a ronald reagan was a lifelong democrat until uh, the goldwater 64 campaign and that's what turned uh, reagan exactly you know and i think that that's something people are seeing in romney i think that's why paul hasn't really gone after romney because he, he he's romney's not trying to say he is a traditional small government liberty focused conservative like paul is but Santorum and Gingrich are both coming out there saying, we're conservatives. We're the conservative that you want to vote on. And Paul has been slaying them and saying, no, you're not. Gingrich, you're an asshole. And Santorum, you're saying that, but you're supporting all these big government initiatives. You're supporting all this spending. You're supporting mm -hmm. all this pork and all these earmarks. So Romney hasn't come out and said, I believe in very small government and I libertarian views and liberty and focusing. He's not saying any of that might be a bad thing for the country god knows we need to do something about the level of federal debt and federal spending but romney's not trying to say he's mr conservative and people should vote for him because of that whereas santorum and gingrich have now i know in the debates romney said he's a conservative businessman and maybe this is semantics a conservative businessman and a conservative politician may mean two very different things yes a conservative businessman doesn't necessarily like to take risks whereas a conservative politician it's totally different so maybe mitt romney's just throwing the word in there in, in lying but i think mitt romney's not trying to be something he's not and where Santorum and Gingrich have tried to do that, and, and Paul's been attacking them. And I think that's what explains why Paul isn't as violent towards Mitt Romney. Not to say that that's going to change. I think if you You know, I think Ron Paul is the best example of what you see is what you get. I think what you see is the God's honest person. Yeah, I'd have to go I don't think there's really anything phony about him at all. Nope, he's he's. I think he's as honest as they come. You know, he's, yeah. he's an honest Abe, and yeah. he is what he is. He doesn't change his views. He gives them mm -hmm. honestly. It pisses people off. Right. But it's integrity is what it is. It's character and it's class. And people say we we don't have that in politics anymore. But some it's people, people do. Yeah. It's some people do. It's people Jimmy like Carter me. certainly had it. You know, he might go down as well. Maybe now the second worst president in history. But look at what he's doing till this day in his mid eighties. Incredible. Yeah, uh, the the work that that man does. So he was another one that had it. Yeah, no, you're you're absolutely right. So I mean, they're they're there. You just got to look at it for what it is. And I think Mitt Romney has that level of integrity too. I think again, we've talked before about how the fact that Mitt Romney is so wealthy, and, and he's still running for president, and he doesn't care about spending all his campaign money because at the end of the day, he's going to go home and still have a great life. Santorum, I think, too, is a guy with some class. And Gingrich just doesn't. Yeah, we've said before, both of us uh, really like Santorum. There's something about Santorum that we like. I don't dislike yeah. the man. Absolutely. You know, and it's funny. I get upset because people keep saying, oh, you know, it's such a weak Republican field. It's such a weak Republican field. I don't agree with that. I mean, tell me what a strong Republican field. I, I think this is a very strong Republican field, all the way down to your John Huntsman's and Michelle Bachman's. I yeah, think, I mean, you, you know, got, you... look at look at the original nine or whatever it was. I think that this was always a very strong Republican field. I do. It's just, it, I think what people don't realize is because there's so many people running and the votes are split so many ways, that's an indication of a strong field, mm -hmm. not a weak field. I mean, Herman Cain burst onto the scene, and I will always be disappointed that Herman Cain didn't go further because he too had a surge. And if it wasn't for those damn allegations that probably weren't true anyway, he'd be in a situation. But he came out and he brought some energy. He brought people to the, the Republican Party, and I mean – his speeches and stuff, people were excited about it in a way that they don't get excited about Romney, Santorum, or Gingrich. Kane excited people. Huntsman people like too. Everyone kept saying, who's this guy Huntsman? Well, you know, you know I'll, I'll tell you, I was just going to bring him up. I didn't think all that much of him. Not that I disliked him, but I didn't think 
that positively of Huntsman either when he was still in the race. But you know what? I miss him now. Yeah, absolutely. Again, I think, you know, he was he was a class act guy. He was a governor, a businessman, former ambassador to China. I mean, he's a, that's and, a and very our, strong And candidate. our pick for secretary of state. Absolutely. He is the official view. Here's an endorsement. Yeah. Viewpoint officially endorses John Huntsman for, for secretary, secretary of state. Of state. Absolutely. Of who gets elected and, and we've been saying this for four or five months now, whatever right. it's, it's over been. the summer, I think. Yeah. Perry was a really interesting character. I mean, he's governor of Texas. It's a big state. He's very popular down there. I think he came off trying to act like the Mitt Romney, and that's not him. I encourage you, Viewpoint listeners, please, please, please go to YouTube and look up the video of Rick Perry in New Hampshire, the speech that says they said he was drunk or on drugs or whatever. It is a riot. I mean he's he, he he does seem like he's a little inebriated. But the way he's talking, it's almost like somebody – he's really talking to you. I mean he literally is sitting there and he goes, yeah, you know, I mean it's, it's about freedom, man. And, you know, it's hilarious, but you get an impression that this is a guy. He's talking who, to you, yeah. He, is, he really believes what he's saying. I mean, is he a character? Sure. But if you go to you go to the origins of our politics in this country, look at the Founding Fathers. They were all characters. They were all interesting, weird, in their own way, brilliant, intelligent, integral men. I mean, look at Ben Franklin. I love Ben Franklin to death. What a character. Speaking what a character, of characters. Absolutely. The only one that wasn't a character was, you know, probably George Washington yep. because he was just an amazing, outstanding, stand-up kind of guy. But, I mean, a lot of them were very – I actually this summer had the chance to visit Monticello. And, I mean, Thomas mm -hmm. Jefferson, what a character. Another I mean, character. Intelligent and brilliant and all that. But, I mean, he, he did his own inventing. He, he, yep. he just – these people were – in a sense, a little out there. So when you see those kind of weird kind of characters like well, Rick Washington, Perry, he ran moonshine, didn't he? Um, you know, he probably did. I, I actually had a chance to visit. Yeah, I think Washington was into. Uh, he had his own distillery and everything. Oh yes, yes, he did. I, I had a chance to visit his estate, which mm -hmm. I highly, highly recommend to everyone. Beautiful view of the Potomac, yep. and you actually can see. And it was the first time in my life that I got a chance to do it. You can see where our first president is buried. Right. Just an amazing experience to see where the man is. But you're right. So, you know, these people and I'm not comparing the current field of Republican candidates to the founding fathers by any means. We we always seem to want something in politics and then we don't have what's always worked. I mean, these people are characters. I'll give you another character. Dennis Kucinich. Total yeah. nut job. Total, total wackadoo. Who, who we should say is finally gone. He uh, he lost his reelection bid. Right, he did, or he lost his primary bid as well. Yeah, so right. he's just given up. Yeah. But you know, he's a bit of a character, and, and I mean, you know, he has integrity too. And then you look at Ron Paul. I mean, he is who he is. Newt Gingrich, despite the fact that he's a jerk, I mean, you've got somebody former Speaker of the House, brilliant college professor, has a PhD, written all these books, and not just like political books, but history books, real books. Mm -hmm. And then you got Santorum, you know, Heartland, Rick. It's really a strong field, and people out there need to realize that. The fact that one candidate right from the beginning didn't just take over and wasn't that – that's a weak field. That is a weak field of contenders. The fact that this started off with five, uh, eight or nine people yep. who have all had surges, who have all had to battle it out, who we've all learned more than – that is an indication of a strong field. You know, I, I want to say that every one of them was the front runner at some point other than Huntsman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think everybody I think at one point was a front runner except John Huntsman. Right, and, and I mean there is a cross spectrum of the party there, and people yep. looking at that. I'm going to mention Herman Cain again because he's a mm -hmm. great guy, Herman Cain. That's a strong field, people, not a weak field. Just like when people talk about all oh, this primary process needs to end. No, the longer a primary process runs, the better it is for our democracy. The better it is for both parties. I tell you, I think that if there's a weakness on a left, on the left, it's the fact that if you look at most of the last elections, they haven't had big primaries. They haven't had five, six, seven, eight people running. It's always there's like three one no. drops. Four years ago it was Hillary and Obama. Exactly, you know, and then before that it was it was Kerry and Edwards, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And then before that, what was it? Gore and Bill Bradley, and then Bill Bradley dropped. You there know, you go. got, got that's not a strong democracy. That's no. not a strong party. That's a weak party. That's no choice. And that's exactly that's no choice is what it is. And if that's one thing you can say in a country where we praise democracy, where President Obama is supposed to be all about choice. People had a choice throughout this Republican primary. I don't think it's necessarily over yet. It's probably going that way. But I'm glad that Super Tuesday wasn't the determinant. Who in their right mind? I mean, guys out there listening to me, think of it this way. Why? I think our trifecta Tuesday was bigger than Super Tuesday. It absolutely was. Why Why do you want elections to be done early? Here's I often annoy a friend of mine by saying this. If you look at what all the establishment politicians on both sides of the aisle want, 
when that's the same thing that you want, that's an indication of a problem. Mm -hmm. The establishment politicians on both sides wanted this primary wrapped up as soon as possible, and that didn't happen. Why do you want what the establishment politicians on both sides want? Because those are the people that are ruining this country. They don't want the democracy. They don't want right. elections. They don't want it to be real. People talk about how terrible a brokered convention could be. We've talked about this before. If you, Years ago, you got to the convention floor, and that's when the party actually picked their nominee. You didn't know. It wasn't smoky backroom deals. It was people shouting across the aisles at each other, yelling and screaming. I mean, that's real democracy. Whoever told you that democracy is supposed to be pretty, that it's supposed to be beautiful and nice and a pretty picture and, and clean, it, they lied to you. They absolutely lied to you. Democracy may be beautiful in theory. It is not in practice and it's not supposed to be. It's ugly. It's gross. It's sausage making. People shouldn't see it in, in, in the light of day in a sense. That's what democracy is supposed to be. It's supposed to be knock down, drag out brawls. And that's what we've had in this primary season. Let this be a lesson. I hope every primary is like this. I can't say it enough. It's good for democracy. It's the best thing for our country. It shows that people care and that people are actually looking for leaders and they're willing to fight it out. What kind of people are we when we just want two or three candidates to go on stage and be like, oh, this one's pretty much the best one. Let's go with him. Well, and, and all 92 of those debates also got amazing ratings, too. They really the did. highest ratings ever. Exactly. So it shows that people were watching. People were paying attention. And I think maybe that annoyed some people. The people who weren't paying attention couldn't understand why everyone else was. Because mm -hmm. we wanted to see what there was this, to all these candidates. We wanted to know what was going on. This has been such a heavily covered primary season. And I think that's a wonderful thing. And I hope it continues. Uh, the general election is not too far off. See, we're now five months in a week, I believe, from the first convention. We're going to have to see what happens. I don't think it'll be a brokered convention. But ladies and gentlemen, just remember that democracy is important and we want things like this to happen. Nobody wants Paul. Oh, let me rephrase that. There are people out there who want everything to be quick and easy, but I don't. I don't like elections that are called at 902. I don't like when we know what's going on ahead of time. It's not good for us as a democracy. It's not good for our republic. It's not good for our union. It just isn't. I think that's about all we have to say. For this episode of Viewpoint, I ended on a little bit of a rant there. Before we close, I do want to once again thank all of our Viewpoint listeners for continuing to listen and continuing to support us. Please, please, please go to BaseNetTV.com. You can uh, go on there and donate there. I believe this month, Ed, are we running a special with the Jimmy Fund? We are running a special with the Jimmy Fund. BaseNet TV has been covering different Jimmy Fund events for the past three years now. And if anybody goes to BaseNetTV.com, and on our donation link, makes a donation for as little as $1. Between April 1st and June 1st, we will just add up all of the donations that we received in that two-month period, and 20% of the gross of the donations will be donated to the Jimmy Fund. We're not doing it on an individual basis. We're just going to, over a two-month period of time, we'll add it all up at the end of two months, and whatever 20% of that is, if it's 20% of a dollar or if it's 20% of $100,000, we're going to donate that to the Jimmy Fund at the Scooper Bowl the first week of June in Boston, Massachusetts. We have covered for two years in a row and we'll be covering it again this year. We will make a pre presentation at the uh, Scooper Bowl. And I think that's a great thing and just an example of how BaseNet's out there and uh, how we're trying to help out. So again, go on, view us at BaseNetTV.com. You can click to donate. You can donate as little as a dollar. Uh, we're still running our executive, uh, executive yep. producer promotion. So donate as little as a dollar, and we'll list you on whatever show you want, preferably Viewpoint. Also, again, feel free to email us. We always, always, always like getting your emails and comments, and uh, we'll try to weave more of them into, the more sh into more of the shows. I get a lot of fan mail, and I appreciate it. Sometimes it's hard to get back to all my fans individually out there, but you can continue sending me fan mail as well. With that, I think we're going to go ahead and sign off. And once again, thank you, Viewpoint listeners. Continue to listen, and we appreciate your views and your listens and your downloads. And we will be back uh, in a week or two with another episode of Viewpoint. Viewpoint.